Welcome to Exploring the Arts. I'm your host, Ed Cauley. Have you ever walked out of the public library here and looked across the street? You know, there is a meadow over there. I said meadow. It's a garden put together by the Ipswich Garden Club. We're going to look at this work today as not just a garden and flowers, but an inspiration for artists. So come on, let's take a look at this. Watch your step. Have you ever walked out of the Ipswich Public Library and looked across the street and saw this garden and wondered who's responsible for it? I did the other day when I walked across the street and met this lady who was in the garden. In fact, you could hardly see her <laughs> because she had this blue hat on. I was able to find her. And this lady is a designer of the garden. I'd like to introduce you to Barbara Monahan. Barbara, welcome to Exploring the Arts. Thank you for having me. Tell us how this garden all came about. Well, did it just happen, or did you get together? Did you design it? How, did, how do you design a garden? Well, about two years ago, the town um, had, had, had been in the process of rearranging the north green hardscape in some of the softscape, and so with the state of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And so um, they, they had spots that they really were asking clubs and individuals to step forward to take care of and, and describe something positive that could happen there. And so the Ipswich Garden Club, um, which Deb Trevaro um, is now the president of, um, through that, Paula Jones and myself, Barbara Monahan, um, we we came up with the idea to have a butterfly meadow. And you call us a meadow? Yes, um, butterfly meadow. We called it, and so we do have some grasses in there that are um, handsome, uh, but all of the the grasses and the the perennials that are in this garden are what I would call native to New England and Ipswich in particular. Mm -hmm. So we, since it's on the North Green, um, I really felt, and Paula did too, that it would be great to go back historically to be able to have on the North Green plants that could have been around mm -hmm. when Ipswich was founded. Deb, as president, I'd like to know what your responsibilities are, how you can be reached. Mm -hmm. Um, primarily, they're more administrative, so mm -hmm. um, uh, I work with the various committees. Um, we uh, work to establish a budget for our club. Um, we organize the programs that are presented to our members. And of course, I'm not working alone in those things. We have um, other members that work with me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and also, I'm involved in the town beautification as well. That's really my passion, so I, I get involved in the gardens that we sponsor in the community. Um, and how many are there? How many gardens? That you sponsor, yes. Yeah, we have, we have a few. We have um, the one there at North Main, right in the center of, um, of Five Corners, downtown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we also have one at um, Skillman Station. Mm -hmm. And also at uh, the uh, Hurt House, we have a garden there as well. Ah. And so we maintain all of those. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, we love to have more members. If you have interest in joining the Garden Club, um, you can certainly contact me at um, ipswitchflowers at gmail.com. That's my uh, email address. Okay. And if you're interested, we will um, give you more information. Um, 
We also sponsor a very large uh, plant sale um, in the spring, and many of you might have uh, come to that. It's become a tradition for many families um, that live in town or nearby. Gives you a way to raise money for the gardens. We fund all of our programs mm -hmm. through that plant sale. Oh, you do? Yes, oh. and garden members dig in their own gardens and bring their own plants that are native to this area, um, and many antique plants as well. Um, and those are for sale. And, and we have knowledgeable garden club members that are there to, to inform people about the plants and how to care for them. So we do do this just organically too. Everything I do is organic. So everybody came on with that and I believe it's had quite an influence. Even um, Glenn Gibbs of planning, he was very interested it would be organic. And I think it was the first or straight organic garden in Ipswich and how publicly. And how did it work for you this year? Did it work? We had um, good soil brought in. We amended it with organic amendments um, to help it, help the water move through it because it hadn't been used like this. Uh, we put some gypsum down. Everybody might like to know that. It helps water mm -hmm. permeate if, if, if you're planting area isn't isn't draining well. Does the soil have an effect on the color of the plant? Yes, it does. It does. It does. Uh huh. <laughs> right here in Massachusetts, here in Ipswich, our soil is acidic rather than neutral. Mm -hmm. If you're out west, um, the western part of the United States, it, it becomes alkaline. And so here, um, it, it will affect the color of the plants. Um, one way and then um, as it goes toward neutral differently. So when we brought soil in, we had soil that was pretty native to the mm -hmm. area too. The garden really uh, fits the mission of our, our club, of the garden club, because um, our mission is education, conservation, and beautification. So it, it hits all, all three points. And in terms of the education part, you know, we, we're having uh, local school children come over to tour the garden. Um, in first grade at Winthrop School, they study the migration of the butterfly and the life cycle of the butterfly. So those classes will be coming down to learn about the different plants that are needed to sustain the butterfly. And so Barbara and Paula are both going to lead those discussions for the school children as well. The year before this, the butterfly weed, uh, we used the milkweed and the butterfly weed to attract the monarchs in particular. And um, the butterfly weed had a hard time because when we planted it, it was very dry, the air was very dry. And uh, we, you know, we try to conserve with the water. This year, I think we've only had to water by hose four times, oh. no more than five, but mm -hmm. I think it was four. And we do that um, when the band's on, we have to be up here and finish mm -hmm. by you know, five o'clock. I so. I could add on that uh, First Church has graciously offered the water oh. for That's us when right. we need it. So oh. they've been really wonderful about yes, that. Yes, they have. And I do water in the morning, not at night, mm -hmm. because at night you get um, insects that you don't want, uh, and you also get uh, diseases. So you don't want that to be able to build up during the evening. Um, and so we always water in the morning or during you know, the daytime when you can do that. That's interesting. Would that apply to anyone with a garden? That's yes. The, even a vegetable garden? You, mm -hmm. you should know. do it, uh, you can do it just a little before dawn, or you can do it in the early parts of the morning, but you don't want to do it when ah, it's very, very hot. Because it attracts hot. insects that you don't want. Right. Mm -hmm. And we do have a beneficial system set up here now to do with the insects. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's starting to balance out and I find it takes about two years to balance out an organic garden that way and uh, the other thing that I use which people ha here have not been too familiar with but when you have certain certain um, insects like mealybugs I'll say or white fly mealybugs or white fly then what happens is I take the mulch out further from the stems of the plants. In fact, uh, if you have a tree or the stems of the plants, you want the mulch to be a bit out from it so that that doesn't get soggy with the mulch. But what I do is I, I clear the mulch out a little further and then I put down uh, worm castings. And uh, there are worm castings. Uh, I know Corliss has them. I think it's the coast of Maine that makes them. 
They're quite costly, but you just put them right around that plant and you water it in. And then a few couple of days later, you water it in again. And most, I know white fly, I know mealybug, I've worked it with other, other insects too. Any sucking insect, most of them hate the taste of the worm castings. Uh, I want to get to the, what makes a garden beautiful in terms of its artistic uh, appeal and its aestheticism. What, what is it? You talked about the planting and the ground and the getting it ready, but how do you put all these colors together and these plants together to create an artistic expression? Well, I think you choose pretty much what your palette's going to be, just like you would in a painting. And you might have um, a, spe a special um, prominent other color just as an accent. But you put that together, and, I, and as I worked with this, I basically came up with some pinks and apricots, uh, some blues, a lemon yellow in one of the perennial flowers. And then to make sure that in the autumn, well, in this fuchsia color that you get with the echinacea mm -hmm. and you get this purpley fuchsia with the asters also. Um, so you have accents in the colors and you want to make sure that as, as long as that plant is up, once in a while you cut one back, but as long as that plant is up, you want it to have interest. So you would like to, after it goes by, to have seed heads. If you can cut it down, you still keep some of those seed heads because it's a different texture mm -hmm. and tone. Yeah. And as you get to this part of the season, you're really getting into fall and you have a lot of um, kind of neutrals coming into play. But the heights, the textures, and the Joe Pye weed, some people have said, well, this is a weed. And I said, yes, but it was here, you know, long, long ago. And somebody, just like somebody's trash is somebody else's treasure. So the same thing in a garden. Uh, what's a pie weed? It sounds delicious. <laughs> <laughs> it's the two tallest ones and one that's kind of medium height back there. Uh, and what I like about it is it blows in the breeze oh. too. So if you're up here when that's it's windy. So it isn't just the stationary flower, you're interested in the movement as well. The gracefulness Never of it. Never even thought of that. Mm -hmm. And you have to so make... So you're going after many senses rather than just the visual, right? Right, like because of course of you have the scent yeah. also. Yeah. So listen, what do you do? Do you lay out a great big piece of paper and take your pencil and start drawing these plants in? Well, How do you design it? Well, what I did, it start? What I did was I, I started by um, just putting up a big pile of books around me that, to, to search out the plants which would be appropriate and to try to figure out plants which would work through the seasons. So as soon as the snow wasn't on the ground until it came again, that we'd have something happening in the garden all the time so that people could see and enjoy. The, the town did put the benches here, which is wonderful. And, and when we're up here working, we see people all the time little children, older people, you know, just sitting and waiting for someone or reading books, whatever. So it's used a lot. Um, and so we wanted something that would be interesting. If you were gonna walk by here every day going to work perhaps, that it would change as the seasons changed. And so it does do that. And I had to um, uh, convince people that the way I work is rather intuitively because my background is in the arts and I do do fine art too. And so they kind of went with my feelings and, and let me take the lead on this. Do you do like a, 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 a preliminary sketch? Or like I a did a sketch, right. Did. I okay. did do a sketch. In my own head, I can see it all. Yes. And as an artist, you know that. Yeah. Um, but what I did was, I, after having picked out, um, let's say, three dozen plants that I thought would work and we could have access to, then I did a sketch with a symbol for each one mm -hmm. and where it would go. And as you can see, as you look at it, you aren't looking at just the, the width of the plant. You've got to have interest in the height. You have to have different textures. 
different colors, a plant that might bloom in the springtime would then so have these seed heads aren't just now. Accident, accidental. They're, no, they aren't. Oh. They aren't. One of the great things about flowers for an artist, I think, is they don't run away on you. They stay <laughs> <laughs> And you can set them up pretty much the way you want to. Right. And they don't fight back. They, uh, they stay yeah. where they're put for a while yeah, anyway. They, they flourish. Because lighting great. has a big effect on the painter's art as well. It, of course, because I think you don't have anything without the lighting. Right. That, that to me, um, is a very huge basic to do with it, the lighting. And I have done some painting when I've been outside, and, and you, you really learn about the lighting that way if you go and paint a landscape, because it changes so quickly. Yes, it does. And even if the sun is in the same place, you get the cloud that just happens mm -hmm. to hit it somehow, or the wind changes where the particular flower, plant, tree is. Mm -hmm. So that's fascinating to me um, to work with that. And that basically was when the lighting as a student that came to mind. I thought it might be interesting if right now if we took a little break here mm -hmm. and you could walk me through the flowers. Robert, let's go into the garden and find out what is so interesting to the monarch butterfly. What's this you have in your hand? This is milkweed, and this is one of the two plants we have in this garden. This is milkweed, and then this little orange plant, which is quite low, is called butterfly weed. And these are the two plants in the garden that are specifically um, hosts to the monarch butterfly. So when they fly up from Mexico, they love to find one of these two plants. Um, so this particular they, one, this particular one see, comes best by seeds. And these are the big seeds. These are the seeds, huh? Seed pods. Yeah. And this has all become my passion, really. And I did want to say about designing. For me, I don't do it by formula. I do it by where the site is, what its intention is, always do it organic, and I do paint with the plants. What is this green This here? green one here is going to bloom. I had hoped it would be blooming. You can see all the little buds that are here. This is a type of goldenrod, and um, this one is kind of a twisting goldenrod uh, instead of the very tall, rigid mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. I believe this one um, is called firecracker. And it just, it's very delicate, and, the, and it, it should be out any day now. What is this plant over this here? This is echinacea. Echinacea. Yes, and uh, I think it's beautiful. Uh, this is, I like this because it, it goes back to the beginning, the original color of it. You now mm -hmm. see, you now see it in yellows and sherbets and reds and whatever, but this is the true echinacea. And, it, and you can see, as well as butterflies. On the top of this one, you can see how some of the them camera. have been, uh, some of the seed head has been eaten away here. And that's by bees. They love to come on it and for some reason like these little brown spikes. And so whenever you see one like that, it's usually the bees. The sign of bees. You huh? get a lot of yes, bees around yes, here, which is yeah. terrific. Uh, this is aster out here, and this is your New England aster, New England, New York, they're similar. And so that will soon, within yeah. probably a week, it would just be purple. So that's one of the final colors that comes into this garden, that and the golden rod. All of these plants are what I call water wise, mm -hmm. okay, so I'm not saying they don't need any water at all. But once you use the mulching on it and have good soil that is porous and all, mm -hmm. then most of these plants will survive on very little water. And this is one of the sedums. This is called Autumn Joy. And here it, it comes out when it's happy, and this one is. It, it's a, a pretty, pretty nice. Um, I love the name, Autumn Joy. Autumn Joy, yes, yes, yes. that's when it comes out. And then this one next to it is brilliant. It's called um, Brilliant Sedum. Yeah, yeah. And that one has the pink. Mm -hmm. So these will last for another couple of months. Now, this, is a, this is another interesting plant in here. This, uh, 
That's Baptisia, and yeah. that blooms um, beautiful kind of raspberry blue in the springtime, and I love that because it has a light feel to, to again, over there, there's another one right there, mm -hmm. when it blows and all. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I can see your garden now. Look at, look at it move. You never notice that, do you, until you mention it, that the garden's moving. Right, it goes right. with the breeze and right. creates another beautiful artistic illusion. And this time of year, when you've worked with it all year round, there's the rutabecchia that a lot of people love so much, you know, from around here. Mm -hmm. um, they become friends, and you try to just make them work the best they can. One thing we found is Coreopsis. We haven't found one yet that doesn't uh, eventually have mildew on its leaves. And so uh, we're working on getting the best straightforward plants to be in this garden. It never will be a static garden. Mm -hmm. It will be ever-changing. So, so Barbara, next year's garden won't be quite like this. It'll be a little different. We will have uh, taken a couple of plants out that didn't didn't work so well, mm -hmm. mostly environmentally, mm -hmm. and um, try try something a little different. And we will have added a few little what I call surprises. Okay. So a little lemon yellow flower that just pops up, and the Queen Anne's lace um, plants like that that just give you a surprise. Barbara, I just want to thank you for having exploring the arts here today. I've learned so much about a garden in terms of its artistic and aesthetic beauty. Also, I learned that a garden can be a meadow. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed it greatly.